All right. Hey, friends, welcome back. We're now in session 30 of the Sinai Design Study. We left off last session discussing Psalm 68, and we read about Israel lying down um, like, like sheep at rest as their leader, as their, uh, the chief shepherd, as their great shepherd is going before them. And so they're at peace. And then it goes on, by the way, and it talks about Israel. It describes Israel as a dove whose feathers are adorned with silver and gold. And you go, well, what's this talking about? Well, interesting, I just say this as a side note. I'm not going to quote all of the verses. Um, but there are about three or four times throughout the scriptures where Israel is referred to as the Lord's dove. One time he refers to her as a silly little dove. And it's interesting that it seems to be sort of a pet reference for Israel. And because they are with the Lord, because they are now in the process of being redeemed and saved and at rest, they're described as being adorned with silver and gold. It's just a, a very sort of intimate, sweet, and, uh, and beautiful picture. But again, we described, we talked about how Psalm 68 describes Israel marching up through the region of Edom, of modern-day Petra, of Basra, known as the Sheepfold. Well, interestingly, Micah chapter 2 has uh, a portion of Micah, describes this, and it's really pretty profound. So I want to sort of piggyback off of Psalm 68 and look at Micah chapter 2. The Lord says, I will indeed gather all of you, Jacob. I mean, incredible eschatological language. I will gather Jacob. I will collect the remnant of Israel. Again, it's the remnant that will be saved after the time of Jacob's trouble. He says, I will bring them together like sheep in a pen. This is not just poetic language. The Lord will actually gather them as he's marching in Petra as they make their way up through Petra. And by the way, during the Exodus itself, as they came to the kingdom of Edom, they were actually turned away and they had to sort of go around. They had to go around parts of Edom. So here, when Jesus returns as the greater Moses, during the ultimate exodus, the greater exodus, they'll actually pass right through. They will not be denied, right? He says, I will bring them together like sheep in a pen, like flock, like a flock in the middle of its pasture, again at rest. And he says, and I will make them... Oh, so this is actually... So that's um, verse 12. Now, the Jewish Publication Society, the JPS, Tanakh, okay, so the Jewish translation, this is how the Jewish translation reads of verse 12. I will make them all like the sheep of Basra. It actually says Basra, like a flock inside its pen. So that name there, when it's sheep in a pen, it's actually in the Hebrew Basra. But you don't see it in translations often. It says, it will be noisy with people. So inside this, this sheep pen, there's going to be an abundance of people. One who breaks open the way will inv- advance before them. The Lord himself is the breaker. One, he is the trailblazer, the forerunner. I mean, he is the, the one that is breaking the way before them. They will break out. They will pass through the city gate and leave by it. Their king will pass before them. Oh, the Lord as their leader. It's just beautiful. Now, look at this. All of the themes in Micah chapter 2 that we just looked at, again, which tie into Psalm 68, the Lord promises to gather the remnant of Israel, specifically like sheep in their pen, and then Yahweh himself will go before them. Their king will go before them, leading them out of the sheep pen, specifically as the breaker, as their glorious king. Like, Everything here just drips with eschatological fulfillment. The fulfillment of all of the promises, the end of the covenant cycle at the end of the age, the return of the Lord is the ultimate redemption, the completion, the end of this beautiful Exodus story. Verses 15 through 16, this is from the NIV. Mount Bashan, majestic mountain. Mount Bashan, rugged mountain. So now we're speaking in all likelihood of Mount Hermon today. It's called Mount Hermon, up in the Golan, up in the north. Why is it talking about this? And by the way, this is the only mountain, if you're not familiar with it, it straddles the border of Israel, Lebanon, and Syria. Um, My friends Dalton Thomas, FAI, they're headquartered up there. They look at Mount Hermon. It's the only place in Israel where you can actually go skiing. They actually do go skiing up there in the winter. And why is it referring to Mount Bashan, this mighty, mighty mountain? Well, Mount Bashan 
is the place that within the book of Enoch, it refers to the sons of God came down. That's where they sort of struck hands and made the decision that they would go into the daughters of men and commit the rebellion, which ultimately led to the Nephilim. This was one of the rebellions. You know, we have the fall in the Garden of Eden. We have Satan's rebellion. We have these sons of God that came down. There's actually a lot that's messed up about this world for what it's worth. And so when Jesus is standing there in front of Mount Hermon, and there's a, there was a temple there to Pan, which they viewed in the Greek world as sort of a, a gateway to the underworld, to Sheol or hell. Jesus was standing there and he gave a lesson. He said, listen, the gates of hell aren't going to prevail. You know, so he was actually using what was there as a reference. And Dr. Michael Heiser does a good job of sort of laying this all out and saying what Jesus was basically saying is, listen, you fallen principalities, your day is done. I'm coming for you and your day is over. You know, all that you thought you would accomplish is about to be destroyed. It was a direct confrontation. The gates of hell don't advance. The kingdom of God advances against it. So why is Mount Hermon, which is associated with Baal, which is associated with the watchers, these fallen sons of God, or the, yeah, the sons of God and this type of thing, why is it, it says, why do you gaze with envy? Why is this mighty mountain, rugged mountain, looking down at Mount Zion, where God chooses to reign, where the Lord himself will dwell forever? So the picture is Mount Bashan, this mighty mountain, looking down at, relatively speaking, little puny Mount Zion. And Mount Hermon is jealous. Why did God choose to dwell there? And this is just such a beautiful picture. We see this so consistently. I mean, even in the life of David, right? The Lord looked at all the brothers, tall, strong, and he goes, I'm going to pick little David. He's going to be the one that I choose. The Lord chooses those things which be not as though they were. He chooses the weak and foolish things of this world. And in the same way, he chose Bethlehem, right? Like, I mean, throughout the scriptures, you see this pattern, and he chose Zion. This is the place that he chose where his feet will dwell forever. And so Mount Hermon is jealous. It's a, it's a wonderful picture. Verse 17, the chariots of God are 10,000 times 10,000, thousands upon thousands, myriads. So now it describes the chariots of God. Now, here's what's interesting, and I'm not going to go down this road too much, but in ancient times, and I think I referenced this uh, earlier, the chariots of kings often had wheels. Now, throughout the scriptures, God's chariot is described as having wheels. Of course, Ezekiel describes it, and the wheels are also like cherubim, and it's really pretty crazy stuff. But God comes not just with the armies of heaven, but the armies of heaven are riding chariots accompanied by horses. And so throughout a lot of these prophecies, the language of horses are often exchanged for chariots, chariots and horses. And in the same way that the Lord will come from myriads of his holy ones, here in Psalm 68, as it said there back in Deuteronomy 33, right? The Lord comes from Sinai, from myriads of his holy ones. The New Testament references that. The book of Revelation says he comes back from, um, in, in, from heaven with armies riding on horses. And he himself is on a horse. And here the chariots of God are myriads, thousands upon thousands. Verse 17b. This is absolutely amazing. It says... The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. Wait, what? Okay, so let me just start with this. The Lord is among them. I mentioned in previous sessions, two sessions ago, that this psalm was like, likely sang as the pilgrims made their way up to celebrate Sukkot, which is to look forward to the day when God would dwell amongst us, right? Now the Lord is amongst them. He is present. The return has happened. His feet are on the ground as he makes, as the king makes his way up to be enthroned in Jerusalem. And then it says this, Sinai is in the sanctuary. What do we mean Sinai is in the sanctuary? When God came down on the mountain, the God of fire and thunder and glory and awe and trembling and earthquakes, the bridegroom God of Mount Sinai is present in Zion in the sanctuary. Like, I mean, it just oozes with fulfillment and culmination, longing for thousands of years. Sinai, the glory of that theophany 
yea, even something greater is now manifest. God himself, Yahweh himself, Yeshua, the incarnation of Yahweh, is on the ground in person in his holy temple. It's just a, such a rich picture. Verses 21 through 23. Surely God will shatter the heads of his enemies. Okay, now it goes back to this theme of the crushing one. Again, remember Genesis 3.15. The first reference to the Messiah is what? The skull crusher. He will crush the head of Satan, and yea, the seed of Satan, the hordes of Satan, the armies of the Antichrist, the enemies of Israel, the enemies of the people of God, the enemies of you and I. God will shatter the heads of his enemies, the hairy crown of him who dies unrepentant. We don't celebrate the death of the wicked. We pray that the wicked would repent and that God would give them the same grace that he gave to us and save them. But if they don't repent, if they go down in their guilty deeds, the Lord will shatter the hairy crowns of him who goes down, who goes on unrepentant in his guilty deeds. And then it says, I'll bring them back from Bashan. So the, the language is at the end of the millennium, the wicked are resurrected and then judged and cast into the lake of fire. And this is really brutal type of language. It says, so that your foot may bathe in their blood. The tongue of your dogs may have its portion from your enemies. So very similar language. We see this in Ezekiel 38, 39, the armies of the Antichrist, Gog and Magog. They're being eaten. The, everything that creeps on, they're licking the blood and so forth. And here you go, wait a minute. Is this something that Christians should celebrate? Look, what does Paul say in Romans? He says, the God of peace. This is our brother Paul in the New Testament. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Okay, We will participate with Jesus in his ultimate victory, we who receive our glorified immortal bodies. Now here is just another glorious couple of verses, verses 24 through 26. We have seen your procession, O God. There it is, the royal procession, the procession of my God, my King, into the sanctuary. Here he goes. And then it says this, the singers go before them, maidens, musicians after them, in the midst, maidens beating tambourines. Bless God in the congregations. Bless the Lord, you who are the fountain of Israel. So this is just a, a psalm that has something for everyone. There's battle, there's warriors, there's bloodshed, and it's a musical. The worship leaders are going before them, singing, and the maidens, the women banging tambourines are behind. I mean, this, the, the wrath of God is being poured out. Lightning is shooting out of his hands. He's radiating like the sun, marching forward. And the worship leaders, just like King David, dancing wildly before the ark, celebrating with all of his heart. It is a beautiful picture as the king makes his way up to the sanctuary, up to Jerusalem, entering the promised land, once again, like the Israelites of old, except this time it will not be in vain, right? And then finally, we're going to end it here, verses 32 through 35. Sing to God. You know, it just, you can't, can, you cannot not celebrate and sing and worship over so much glory. Oh, you kingdoms of the earth, sing praises to the Lord, to him who rides upon the highest heavens. So here it is again, the one who rides through the skies. Now, some translations will communicate the language of marching through the desert. Either one, it's all part of the same storyline. The cloud rider is the desert marcher from ancient times. Behold, he speaks forth with his voice, a mighty voice. And Jesus will return, right, with the voice of an archangel, the shout with a trumpet. Ascribe strength to God. His majesty is over Israel. His strength is in the skies. Oh, God, you are awesome from your sanctuary. The God of Israel himself gives strength and power to his people. Blessed be God. Guys, you can see why I love this psalm. We need to recover this for the church. It's a psalm to meditate upon, pray through, sing, celebrate, enjoy, dig deeper into. It's an absolutely beautiful picture of the return of the king. So amen and amen. Look forward. In the next session, um, we're going to begin looking at more uh, as, as Isaiah talks about this highway through the desert. It's all telling the same story. It's all part of the same tradition of desert prophecies. So amen. God bless, guys. Until next time, Maranatha.